This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Welcome to Profiles in Discovery. Uh, our guest today is uh, Dr. Nicholas Spitzer. He is a distinguished professor in neurobiology here at UC San Diego. In fact, he was a founding member of not just neurobiology, but of this institution. Played a critical role in making it the number one institution in the land in neuroscience. Part of the way he did that, and one of the most important ways he did that was his science, his actual research. And we're going to hear about that in a, in a little bit. Uh, it's truly fascinating. But I want to just take a moment to mention some of the other things that he's done that's been so important. He helped bring the best and the brightest to UC San Diego, uh, and part of that was the role model he provided, but it was also the other kinds of things he did. For example, he's been head of KIBM, Cavley Institute of Brain and Mind. And this institute lets people in diverse areas work together uh, to pursue innovative ideas and break open new areas of research. It's been very exciting, very productive. Um, he's contributed internationally. The Society for Neuroscience, with its thousands and thousands of members, played a major role in that. Headed up, for example, uh, the creation of brainfacts.org, a website open to everybody, the public, and has been very successful, millions of hits every year. Numerous other activities as well we could talk about, but let me come back to his science. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about a little bit later. This is what's been so remarkable, a true game changer. Uh, what Nick has done over the years is to take on um, embedded, uh, established ideas um, uh, that are really widely held in the field, dogma, you could say, and bring a creative view to it, a new insight into it, and say, no, no, actually, that's wrong, and to find the right way, and to show with hard work and insight and rigorous experiments and compelling arguments that this was the proper way to see things, this new way. And amazingly enough, convince the entire world of that, the entire community of that. Now that is uh, extremely rare and extremely difficult. So it's not a surprise that he's a member of the National Academy of, of Science now. Uh, many other awards, and accomplishments, recognition. How did you get into neuroscience? How did you choose this as your as your career. Thank you, Darwin. I, it was an interesting trajectory, uh, I, I think. I started out as an undergraduate at Harvard, majoring in physics, following in the footsteps of my father, Lyman Spitzer. This didn't seem to work, fit quite right, uh, so I switched a uh, real pendulum swing into Slavic and linguistics, but I took a course, an introductory course in biology taught by George Wald, uh, and this really opened the door. So it sounds like people could have major influence who are effective instructors. Did that happen at other points in your career? Well, I think mentors can play a big role. They certainly played a big role for me. Uh, George uh, was a Nobel laureate for his important work on the nervous system, uh, and he could have sold any one of us a used car. This man was an incredible salesperson, in addition to being an amazing scientist. And he turned me on to neuroscience. I went and worked in the laboratory of John Dowling at Harvard, who was a young assistant professor. And, and at that point, the hook was in. And I was on the line, and it was downhill from there. Uh, uh, I really wanted to go into neuroscience. Given who you were moving among and, and where you were and everything, Medicine ever cross your mind? A medical well, career, maybe? Yeah, you, you bring up an interesting point. I actually uh, went off to medical school. I, I went to Harvard uh, Medical School for a, a couple of years, but I realized I, I was more interested in the discovery process, and I thought a better way to do that would be to switch to the PhD program there in the new department, the new department of neurobiology, wh where we both uh, worked at different times. Uh, this was a legendary department, the first department of neurobiology in the country, uh, chaired by 
Stephen Kufler, who was, again, an extraordinary scientist and a fabulous mentor. So mentors can make a big difference, and I think that's uh, something that both of us have seen over our careers here at UC San Diego. People in the place, and I appreciate even more now what you were able to do here at UC San Diego. We'll come to that in a minute. Did you ever have any um, go abroad for any experience? Ah, uh, well, yes, yes, actually, and I try to persuade people in my lab to broaden their educational experience by um, going on after they've been at UC San Diego to seek experience elsewhere around the globe. I went to University College in London uh, for my postdoctoral work, worked there with Ricardo Milady, another amazing mentor. Uh, and that uh, set me up then to compete for jobs back here in the States. How did it come about you came to UC San Diego? Because those were beginning days when you came out. It's amazing how that worked out. I remember John Singer, a legendary faculty member here at UC San Diego, was at a meeting in London and he had learned that I was on the job market. Steve Kuffler had put him up to this and he came uh, to see me. He said, Nick, let's go out and have a, have a, have a, a pint at the pub, and we went to a local pub near the lab, and he uh, was a wonderful salesperson for UC San Diego in those early days. Uh, so I visited other institutions, but San Diego really had the promise for growth and the excitement uh, of a young campus uh, that I think captured a lot of people uh, at that time. What can we learn from that, from your experience about how to best position ourselves to move forward and, and continue to be on the cutting edge, to be the leading institution. UC San Diego has been remarkable in its relatively short history uh, uh, in terms of its gr growth and its reputation, as you point out. I think a part of that has been, a big part of that has been the very keen emphasis on the research uh, and the support for research at all levels, the fundamental basic science research and, and the, the translational and clinical aspects uh, of the research. Uh, and of course, we are here for the undergraduates and I think for them, providing this research environment uh, is an additional attraction for them to come to UC San Diego. Maybe now would be a good time to give the audience some sense of what, what you have done in science, what your experience in science has been. Well, uh, it's been a wonderful ride, and I want to emphasize that I, I, I think it's far from over. I'm still uh, very uh, interested in pursuing uh, the objectives uh, that we've uh, developed. But I got very interested in the way in which uh, nerve cells begin to send their electrical signals at early stages of development. This was exciting. It led us to a discovery in the developing nervous system uh, that uh, the way neurons communicate with one another can change in response to uh, both uh, electrical activity and to experiences in the environment. Uh, and so this was a very interesting start uh, on a, a very nice uh, trajectory. Well, I remember uh, all during my training in neuroscience, neurobiology, and up until your work, really, that, that was not the case. You were hardwired. You're a neuron. You make this kind of signaling molecule or that neuron. You do that. You can make more. You can make less, but you can't change. This you is true. You changed that view. Well, you're right, Darren. In the, the, in the early days, I, too, was taught that neurotransmitters, the molecules that neurons use to communicate with one another, are a fixed part of what a neuron has and does. Uh, um, Paul Patterson and Story Landis, mutual friends of ours, had shown in the early 80s that in culture, in, in a dish, uh, nerve cells could change their transmitters, and there was some suggestion that during development that that could occur as well. But we went on to look in the adult animal, in the mammalian brain, uh, uh, and were able to show that experience could lead to changing of neurotransmitters, uh, these neurotransmitter molecules, uh, in the brain of adult mammals with corresponding changes in behavior. And I think that uh, really has opened up a floodgate of opportunities for very interesting uh, questions that we want to try to answer, both about fundamental uh, uh, science, but also about potentially uh, treatments for disease. No, that's phenomenal. I remember, of course, that early work by Paul and Story but I remember not only was it in cell culture, and you said, well, is that real, it's cell culture, but also um, those were neurons that kind of in their lifetime had the opportunity to make those choices anyway. This is fundamentally different. And you bring up a point I want to return to, that you can change it in the adult. Now, for people my age, that's very encouraging, that you could, there's still hope, you know, but, <laughs> um, but to be able to change, you know, for hardcore geneticists, like, and I grew up that way in molecular biology, you're kind of wired in your original genome, one thought. This suggests that you are uh, pliable, available, that you can respond to inputs 
even in adulthood, fundamentally changing what your brain can do. I mean, that's, this is, this that's is true, this is true. I think we've, we've known for a long time that uh, how we are, what we are, who we are is a combination of nature and nurture, of uh, nature, the genes, nurture, the experience uh, growing up. Uh, but it's re really reassuring and I think very interesting to find that there's uh, n additional ways in which the old dog can learn new tricks. Uh, um, and, and this kind of plasticity that uh, we're talking about together here is rather different from the forms of plasticity that we've known about for, for many years that involved other kinds of, of changes in the nervous system. You've played a role uh, in part through KIBM, but also in addition to that, in the National Brain Initiative of Obama's, but also CalBrain. Tell us a little bit about that. This is a very exciting time for neuroscience, uh, Darren, as you know, and you've contributed to this as well. Not only do we have the National Brain Initiative from uh, President Obama, uh, but in addition, we have the California CalBrain Initiative uh, here in the state. And on the campus, our, our chancellor, Pradeep uh, Kosla, has established the Center for Brain Activity Mapping with our colleague Ralph Greenspan at, at the head. So new opportunities here for exciting discoveries. In communicating to people and to reaching out for them to understand this, this brainfacts.org. That seems, say a bit about what that is. You know, I think this has been very important, Darren, and I think we as scientists haven't paid enough attention to outreach and communication to the public about our science and what it can do for the public. Uh, and so in general terms, outreach is very important. Uh, in the past, we did this in person or we did it with printed material and reached effectively a, a limited audience. Now with the internet and, and, and the web as we describe it, uh, the opportunity to reach around the globe uh, to India and to China and to South America uh, is extraordinary and BrainFacts is, is achieving this. So it's been wonderful to be able to contribute at that level. Well, let's return uh, to an, another uh, issue that came up. You talk about the work that you've done and one sees the implications, the flexibility in the adult brain even and so on. It makes me want to ask about uh, an increasingly a popular area of science, now translational research applications of this in useful ways. What I do you think, see as uh, well, you're really touching on a key issue here. Uh, uh, neurological disorders uh, are one of the biggest economic uh, and uh, emotional burdens for our species around the globe. Uh, and we are really not doing as well as we'd like to in terms of treatments for these disorders. The, many of these disorders are disorders of neuronal circuits. How does the circuit work? Uh, and uh, we think now that this kind of flexibility of, of circuit uh, behavior, switching of neurotransmitters, may lie actually at the basis of some of these neurological disorders. And so we and, and your lab as well, Darwin, are now uh, really uh, going flat out, uh, uh, trying to test this hypothesis and see if indeed this is the case. So in fact, test to see if it's the case and then there might be uh, things that, therapeutic strategies one could... Uh... Exactly, exactly. All, all therapies start with some uh, kernel of knowledge about what has gone wrong. Uh, and if we can understand how the transmitters inappropriately uh, changed from one to the other, from an excitatory transmitter that excite, excites neurons to one that perhaps inhibits uh, the neurons, uh, then we could intervene uh, and, and perhaps try to prevent that or try to reverse it to uh, provide useful treatments and potentially cures for some of these neurological disorders. So that could have a big impact on society. Let me use that as an opportunity to ask from the perspective of uh, California, of us here, CBAM, uh, the quite wonderfully the state legislature is uh, stepping up and, and making possible. Um, we, what do you see as the benefits to people in this state from uh, the kind of work that's going on in neuroscience here at UC San Diego. UC San Diego, I think, is, a, is uh, I'll say, the leader in the state of California, uh, although California has a wonderful, uh, 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 rich uh, uh, source of, of neuroscientists, perhaps more than any other state in the nation. Uh, I think there are three benefits that will come uh, to 
uh, people here in the state. Uh, the first is uh, really one that often gets overlooked and ignored, and that's to satisfy people's curiosity about how the brain really works. What's going on between my ears? How, how does this actually function? Uh, and I think we're going to provide some exciting answers there over the next decade or two. Uh, um, and, and beyond, of course. Uh, the second, uh, uh, I think, exciting benefit for people of the state uh, comes to identification of the problems with uh, neuronal circuits and the ability to intervene uh, and actually provide treatments and cures for people, uh, of course, in the state, but even more widely around the country and around the world. And finally, I think the, a third uh, opportunity here for this uh, set of brain initiatives is that it will lead to the development of new tools with which to study the brain. Uh, the engineers here at the Jacobs School are now uh, working hand in glove with neuroscientists uh, through the Center for Brain Activity Mapping to uh, develop these new tools and test them. Uh, this will then lead to the formation of companies. Uh, companies will employ people. This will lead to more jobs for the people in the state of California. And at a very fundamental and practical level, this will stimulate the economy of the great state of, of, of California. So multiple levels here at which uh, I think a big impact will be felt. Very interesting, very interesting indeed. And you know, you reminded me as you were mentioning that about the interactions of these different groups. Uh, That's exactly what KIBM does with the nanoengineers and the biologists and the neuroscientists all interacting, opening up, making new tools, doing things that, new possibilities now because of that, because of that interaction. And of course, it's uh, you know, drawing people here from all over the world. They want to come and they want to work. They want to add their creativity. Yes, yes. So, yeah. Actually, you bring up an important point, I think, here, which is that the Cavalier Institute for Brain and Mind, the KIBM, has, uh, among other things, uh, done a lot to stimulate um, uh, the cross-fertilization across the campus, the cross-interaction of, of groups that had not in the past really uh, seen much interaction. And so one has the brain people, people like you and me who are studying neuroscience and neurology. Uh, and then we have the mind people who are the cognitive scientists and the psychologists uh, who are really looking at the same structure, but from a different point of view. And so often in the past, these have been two siloed groups, uh, different silos, not really interacting. And now I think uh, KBM, uh, along with others, uh, ha has been very uh, helpful in bringing these groups together. Uh, very good. What do you think is most important? How can we most effectively, in the future now, again, recruit the best and the brightest here to keep this tradition going, to take us to the new frontier. Well, this is, this is always, a, always a challenge, and we're always trying to position ourselves best to, to capture the, the brightest young minds uh, and, and, and bring them here to La Jolla, you to San Diego. I forgot to mention that uh, as though Nick doesn't have enough to do, uh, while he's doing all the rest of it, he's also chair of a search committee for two senior positions here and a junior one. So <laughs> hands on here. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. tell us. Well, I think I think uh, it comes, it flows as we've discussed earlier uh, this afternoon. It, it flows from uh, the kind of excellence that we've fostered over multiple decades here now uh, in La Jolla. Uh, it comes from uh, identification of, of people, I would say, you know, frankly, darn like the two of us who are passionate about what we do uh, uh, and, and, and what they do uh, and who are uh, committed to uh, uh, the, the highest standards of creativity and, and research uh, and communication of the findings of that research, not only to students and postdoctoral colleagues here on the campus, but also to the world at large. Uh, and uh, UC San Diego is already doing that. We can, we can do that more and we can do that better. Uh, and I'm very confident that the university will continue to grow in stature and in impact. It uh, takes effort and uh, judgment, as, you've, as you're demonstrating and, and have seen. It also takes resources to be able to uh, attract them, let them get going, and compete with the other institutions. So these are always challenges for UC San Diego and, and the whole UC system. They, they are. They are. And in the current era, when federal funding is perhaps less... Uh, uh, exuberant than it has been in our past. Uh, uh, it's all the more important to be able to uh, reach out uh, to foundations, to the business community, and to others to uh, engage them and help them see how participation with the research enterprise here at UC San Diego can pay big dividends uh, down the road, uh, not only for individuals, uh, but for the public uh, and for the state at large. Absolutely. Thinking and communication in both directions. Yes. Makes yes. a big difference. Yes. Um, if you had 
um, advice to offer or insight to offer to um, either speaking in part, not just as a scientist and a professor, but even as a parent, uh, affecting uh, young people who are making decisions, as you did, as you thought about uh, the various careers, even medicine or physics, something. What, what advice would you offer them about uh, making a choice, a career choice? Well, I think the most important thing, and I, with, with my uh, four children, this has certainly been an emphasis that I've uh, put out uh, to them uh, to try to identify something that really captures you. So try to find something about which you are truly passionate, uh, something that you really want to do, uh, some place where you can see that you, you can define a goal, a set of goals for yourself, uh, and then work hard to achieve them. I think that's, that's fundamental for uh, success. Uh, um, uh, and, and, and then I think w one wants to perhaps, uh, once that's been identified, figure out the, the best way and, and try to plan forward five or ten years so that one imagines where one is going to be at, at different points along the way. Uh, postdoc to junior faculty member, if indeed academia is, is the chosen route, uh, and then on uh, from there. Uh, these are some of the considerations that I think uh, uh, certainly uh, one wants to th be thinking about, uh, actually, uh, even when one is still uh, at an early stage in one's uh, thinking about one's life. As you went through um, this lo long, very productive scientific trajectory of research, um, were you yourself surprised at various times? How can this be? That can't be. I mean, that sort of surprise that you would then revisit it, and, and how did you address it when that would happen? It, w there were a number of surprises along the way through uh, the, the career, uh, uh, Darwin, and it's uh, a, a case, in a case like that, one always goes back and repeats the experiment again and again and again just to make sure that there's not some sort of artifact, some complication here that's leading to a, a fluke uh, in terms of the results. Uh, uh, but I confess that when I b began uh, my career as an assistant professor here on the faculty at UC San Diego, I had in mind the idea that molecular biology, which as we both experienced was really taking off as a, as a, as a fabulous tool for biological and life sciences, that there was more to it than that, uh, and that the electrical signals of the brain that are so important for us as young people and as adults could have some influential role at the very early stages of development. So I was predisposed to uh, have an eye out and to be aware and to think that maybe something like that would show up. Uh, uh, but it was frankly a complete surprise when we found that transmitter switching could occur in the adult mammalian brain. That uh, was something that I did not expect uh, to find. Uh, but we're now, uh, convinced, and I think convincing people that it is, in fact, the case. No, that's remarkable, and, and I've seen this about you and admired it over the years, how different from uh, many people when something is totally out of line for what you expected, you just say, oh, no, no, it's a mistake, and throw it out and keep going. We say, well, how could that be? And then to, then to pursue it, test it the way you have, that's, that makes all the difference, yeah. Given the path you've taken, if you now could be given the choice of saying, uh, because of some power that be, that you can be given an answer to some large question. What would that large question be in science? And with a, a large question that you could come up with the answer. Ah, darling. Uh, Don't you, give us the answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You do yeah. know how to put them. Uh, so um, I think that if I were given this opportunity to have a, a question answered, it would be it would be this. I would. I would dearly like to know whether uh, neurotransmitter respecification, this process of changing neurotransmitters, this transmitter switching process, uh, lies at the heart of a variety of different neurological disorders. Let's say depression, let's say addiction, uh, a, a number of disorders that uh, we're, many people are currently working hard to understand with a view to treatments and cures. It, I would very much like to know whether or not transmitter respecification and switching is involved there. Uh, and the reason is that that would then take a career devoted to fundamental neuroscience and, and uh, then lead it to a translational outcome uh, that would be 
hugely uh, beneficial with, with further work uh, for healthcare of our society. Uh, and that would be deeply satisfying uh, if, if that could happen. That would be wonderful. That would be combining everything from basic research, translation, and having an impact, a real impact on people across the... No, that would be very... I, I understand why that would be so appealing. If you had a moment and you're reaching out to people, what messages would you like to communicate? Anything that you haven't already maybe mentioned? Anything else? That well, I, 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 come, I want to come back to the outreach piece because I think that, that is tremendously important. It's been overlooked. I think scientists in, in the past decades have taken it for granted uh, that um, what we do uh, in our research uh, is important and that it ought to be financially supported by society. Uh, but I think we've, we've, we've taken all that for, for granted. Uh, and that's not good enough. Uh, I think it's very important for all of us to um, be able to communicate what we do and why we do it and what the potential outcomes of it are. Uh, and I look forward as I go along to continuing efforts to uh, try to achieve those goals. Uh, uh, in the end, people who can see that uh, science is beneficial for society, as I think can be very well documented over the, over the ages, uh, I, I think that they will uh, continue their enthusiasm and their support for it, uh, and that will be, uh, uh, frankly, important for the, the future of what we do. Absolutely. Um, you know, I should mention, because I know you won't mention it. Well, first, I mean, you do, this is part of the, what motivated you in brainfacts.org, is motivated you in other things I know. But I'll mention something that, that I know you won't, but I can, and that <laughs> is I share a course with this guy, and I've watched him teach over the years. And I don't think there are many people who are as passionate and committed about what he's teaching and able to motivate the people in the audience accordingly. Students who think, oh, I'm, I'm going to medical school, but I have to take this class, or I think, ah, is this interesting? And they get fired up. Um, and we can, they come up afterwards and they talk to him and they even say this, motivated and fired up because of the example provided, the passion, the insight, and the information. And that moves people. And you can tell it in their applause at the end, which is just overwhelming. Uh, and I've been impressed again and again by that, uh, Nick. It's well, Darren, I have to say, by, I have to return the compliment here because we, I've, you and I have taught this course now for I can't say how many years, but uh, uh, it has to be pointed out that the same uh, needs to be said of you. And I think our joint, it's our joint uh, partnership here that has been the huge success that it has been. It's been a wonderful partnership. Uh, terrific scientist, Nick Spitzer. It's been a pleasure to have you on Profiles and Discovery. Thank you, Darren. Yeah.